History happened everywhere. The verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at the most recent episode, episode 38, the early bird in Jordan during the Paleogene. So if you haven't listened to that, go back, check it out, or else there's going to be spoilers ahead. I'm terribly sorry. Hello, my name is Ryan Weir, and you are listening to History Happened Everywhere, The Verdict. Uh, I'm here in the HHE studio with my good bud. It's Peter Goddard. Greetings, I'm feeling trepidatious today. I'm uh, in front of the beak, as it were. I'm nervous about what's going to go down. Well, we will find out (laughs) very soon. Uh, From our judge, our resident critic, it's Mr. Sorry, Judge Bursley. Thank you very much, and Peter, your rights to be scared. <laughs> We've just had an episode on, on Jordan, so I looked up to see if there are any Jordanian quotes, any motivational quotes, proverbs, things like that that we could use, and I was wondering whether or not we could do some. I can't speak Arabic. I can read it, but I can't speak it. You can read Arabic. I can transliterate. I know, I know what the letters are. Get you, your little hidden skills. You're like a little Swiss army knife. Did you learn when you were working for MI5? I'm afraid I can't tell you. (laughs) I think MI5 would be desperate. Well, you do like a martini, so my suspicions are aroused. Dursley. Paul Dursley. Judge. (laughs) No. (laughs) Absolutely not. Can we call you Judge, by the way? Are we allowed to say that? Like, you know, impersonating a policeman is something that is illegal. Is it illegal to say you're a judge? Or can anyone just say I'm... I think anybody can say that they're anything. It's whether they act accordingly. So if if, if, if I ordered you to be executed, that's probably a bit too far. <laughs> that's worse than a D. Execution. <laughs> you know you've done a bad podcast when the verdict is death. <laughs> Right, let's talk about some Jordanian proverbs. Here's some for you. Let me see what you think. Uh, who knows and who does not know will say a full hand of lentils. So could you run that by me one more time? <laughs> I wonder if there's something in translation that's just... <laughs> <laughs> I feel that yeah, how, how do you do, is that just a literal translation? <laughs> yeah. What can you do? Such is life. That's a proverb. <laughs> that's, I mean, fatalistic, but... I, Christ, that's a, bit, that's a bit defeatist. <laughs> I mean, these, are, these are your motivational quotes, aren't they, right? Yeah. And my favourite one, though, if you have no shame, then do whatever you want. <laughs> That's literally <laughs> the proverb. I think it's supposed to be telling me I should have shame, but I feel like it's encouraging me to yeah. just get out there and just never mind, eh? If you've got no shame, well then, you know, do what whatever you want. <laughs> like, what's what the matter? <laughs> yeah. But we are not here to talk about proverbs. Ancient may they be wise, though they might not be (laughs) baffling as they certainly are we are here to talk about your podcast pete correct why don't you remind us all with a one minute summary on earth you were on about i can do that okay ready i'm ready go we traveled to jordan an oasis of stability in the middle east and birthplace of celebrities such as moses and king herod the great also home to wonders such as the ancient city of petra the mineral rich dead sea actually a lake and the mars-like landscape of wadi rum we also traveled in time discovering eons and eras and periods and epochs discovering life blossoming then dying off in great extinction events of the earth's history we discovered the neck bone of a giant pterosaur or flying lizard that was found in jordan and estimated to be one of the largest flying creatures that ever lived with a wingspan the size of a light aircraft and a stiff neck like an airborne giraffe. This creature was named Aramborgiania and seems to have roamed all over the then tropical world. But a pterosaur is not a bird and we learnt they all died out when a 10 mile meteor crashed to earth in Mexico destroying forests all over the planet and wiping out almost all life. But not all life. Early birds in particular, ground dwelling birds with toothless beaks for picking out seeds and nuts and a gizzard to help crunch them up in its stomach survived the destruction and even thrived becoming the common ancestor of all the incredible varieties of birds we see on the planet today. Last week's episode done, summarised nicely, nice one son, now we're over to a young Dursley who's gonna tell you what he thought of me, he'll take you apart without any care, he's the lovely Paul Dursley, the lovely Paul Dursley. Oh, I remember it all clearly now. It's all come back to you. It came flooding back, didn't it? Flooded in. (laughs) Paul, the microphone is yours. What did you think of episode 38? I actually learned quite a lot 
I, I'm, I'm staggered. <laughs> what really stood out to you? What, what was there something that you were surprised to learn? Well, I'm surprised to learn that all of the names have changed since my day. Of the eras and the periods and whatnot? Yeah, because, you see, even the Paleogene is not something I've heard of. I've heard of the Paleolithic. And then there's the Paleocene as well. Because yes. you were talking at the boundary as well with the Iridium. Now, I always thought that was called the KT boundary. There are unofficial epochs and eras. So there are, there are time periods that are kind of official and some that are not. So the Anthropocene epoch is an unofficial unit of geologic time. Well, they can't decide when it started. Yeah, and it's supposed to be when human activity started to impact the planet's climate. Oh, the climate. I heard it would have been... Oh, we're back to our favourite subject. The first nuclear detonations seeding the Earth with those elements and minerals that were generated in those explosions. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I would have said the Industrial Revolution. I would have said that. That's another, that, that's another one that is you know, in the bag. I think that's probably the leading contender. You think so, isn't it? Well, yeah. But, but of course, you're, you're, you're getting, they didn't know it at the time, but you're getting loads and loads of noxious emissions. So it was starting the changing the atmosphere. But this is unofficial. It's not a real, in inverted yes. commas, epoch. It's just a, well, I mean, I suppose if everyone uses it, then it doesn't really need to be official. But then I got confused and thought, who decides what's official or not? Uh, and it is, in fact, the International Commission on Stratigraphy. Stratigraphy. Or the International Stratigraphic Commission. All right. Okay. So, yeah, I guess there's a group of people who go, yes, rubber stamp, that is now an era or an epoch or a period or whatever. Well, it's, 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 it, well, it's a bit like that thing a few years ago, wasn't it, where you know they changed the solar system so Pluto was not a planet anymore. Yeah, and you'd expect that, right? Just because something was factual 100 years ago doesn't mean it's not going to change with new evidence as it comes to light. I like the fact that things keep shifting and changing. I, th- I think it's putting things into context. Uh, how so? A lot of that, they, people learnt about the about the different eras, but now as we have more in, more information about them, it's not necessarily that the other stuff was wrong. It was just it needs to be looked at in a wider context. Although some some things were wrong, weren't they? When the when the paleontologists made up some dinosaurs, they just sort of randomly stuck the bones together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's that one with a thumb that started out on its nose, isn't there? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, but that's again understandable. We were just, we were discussing this when you just faced with a small little bone and no concept of what it could have been attached to. It is remarkable how we kind of project these versions of what we know with such confidence, (laughs) given that there's really Mm. so little to go on in a lot of cases. What I did like about your episode, though, was that, you know, you highlighted the detective work that goes on behind the scenes. So, you know, the fact that you can see where ligaments and muscles attach to the bone, and so you can work out from that how big those muscles must have been and the kind of weight that it must have supported and from that you can kind of extrapolate and create a visual recreation just from that one little starting point that's kind of cool well you can get some information can't you yeah. you could from that you can't get stuff like what it's uh, what its skin was like and what colors it was you can't get that but if it's a certain Maybe. size then you can work out yeah. how much food it was eating and possibly even the types of food it's eating if it's muscles must require a certain type of vitamin which is only found in certain types of food so it must be eating those things you know you can kind of keep going and keep on extrapolating is 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 my point yes you're 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 right you can sort of deduction you can sort of say well if it's a big bone with a large surface area as as you said there must be lots of muscles attached to it therefore Mm. how do muscles attach now that's unlikely to change so it means it needs to be a certain size Deduction is the right word, isn't it? It's like Sherlock Holmes. Paul, when you said that you learned something here, I wasn't, I, I never know whether or not you're being sarcastic or not. So <laughs> just to clarify. I learned that all the names have changed. Okay. So anything else stand out for you? In terms, in terms of new facts, no, not not really. It was it was interesting getting a, hearing a, a profile of Jordan and hearing yeah how it is stable compared to the other countries around it. Given the as you say the Sykes Pico Agreement that drew that famous line in the sand. Yes, <laughs> it's a literal line in the sand in this case. <laughs> what was it British to the south of it, French to the north of it? Jordanians, no one really bothered to consult. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what we do need to to pull out though Paul and I think I probably need to hold my hand up to this one. Uh, this is an error in this episode. The Dursalator, when it selected the time, it gave you the Paleogene, but it said that was 42 million years ago, which we agreed was slap bang in the middle of the Paleogene. But upon looking at it, 
and I entered this into the Ders later, <laughs> what it meant was the paleo gene lasted for 42 million years, not that it's it was 42 million years ago. So, and have you checked all of the other ones to make sure you haven't made that mistake again? I have gone through them now, and they are now correct. So, how many other geological epochs do you have? In the <laughs> there were a few in the Ders later. Yeah, well, as as, oh, as Pete went through at the time, there's an awful lot. <laughs> he did an entire song about it, if you remember. Delightful ditty. Did you, that song? Did you? Is that your song? Yeah, Pete wrote that. Well, that, that was very good indeed. Ooh. I don't like the way take this episode's a, going. You You're going to get a good yeah. vote. You're going to get a good grade, and I hate it. Take, take a pat. Take a pat on the back. You you need to work that up. Wow. You, that because that the comedy songs are notoriously difficult. That's like the elements one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I edited it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the clapping behind it. That was me. That was all his clapping. I couldn't have done it without him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah, all of our posters, all of our all of our work that says uh, 42 million years ago, it's not wrong, <laughs> but it's it wasn't the paleogene, which was... <laughs> 66 million years ago to yeah, more recently than that. More recently. <laughs> So I have a question for Paul requiring some of his physics knowledge because I got very confused by the Hadean and I did some for the Hadean eon, this is, the very first oh, eon yes, of world's yes, yes. Uh, existence, the mm -hmm. Earth's existence. And I said that it had loads of water and then we discussed, did it have surface water or was it just sort of steaming around in the atmosphere? And we said if it didn't have like rock. it's a planet of lava, how can there yeah, be water? Exactly. So Well, there, would, there wouldn't have been water right at the start. And they're not really sure where the water came from, are they? They think it may have... Came, come from comets well this is where i broadly got confused because the everything I, I didn't spend a huge amount of time on it but it seemed to be referring to water more to the end of the eon anyway so i guess it might not have been there at the start but also it said that they thought they there was definitely groundwater then i was also reading that may have been able to be groundwater at those temperatures because the pressure was different so the, the water wasn't yeah. evaporating so all in all i got really confused and i wasn't sure what was up and what was down <laughs> okay, now that's an interesting thing isn't it because that's when they believe an object smashed into the earth a relatively large object that shattered off a part of the earth that became the moon that's an enormous part of the earth well, it's not really. I mean, the moon's pretty big. Yeah, but it's... Only France is in a moon. <laughs> <laughs> I think the question you need to ask is, what is the surface area of the moon? So the radius of the Earth is four times the radius of the moon. Oh, I thought it was smaller than that, the moon. It looks so tiny So, me. <laughs> So, well, don't forget, it's a quarter of the radius. Okay. So a quarter of a quarter, it'll be a sixteenth of the area. Right. And a 64th of the volume. Right, that does sound tiny again. So it's one, one in 64, so about one and a half percent of the Earth is... Oh, we can afford to lose that. One and a half percent got knocked out by something hitting the Earth and it became... It and I, I said it wasn't that much, which I think we can agree that one and a half percent isn't that So much. does that mean it sort of fell off as a lump and then became round like a droplet of water as it drops through the yes, air? Yes, because it, it, it was big enough for the gravitational forces to make it spherical. Wait, and wait, how was it, it rock how does, or was it magma? Well, it would have been rock and magma, and, and so it would have coalesced around the two bodies. So this is what I was reading about the Hadean, is that it wasn't quite that there was no rock at all, but it kept getting, there was some subduction current so that the rock would form and, and then get pulled into the lava. So right, it was this okay. cycle of, so it's rocky magma. Rocky magma. Yeah. Mm. Which is a great name, by the way. Rocky magma. <laughs> 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 That's going to be my stage name. <laughs> <laughs> but it's amazing that cheese can survive those temperatures. Cheese? Yeah, the moon. So what you did there. Uh -huh. That's quite good. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think the surface area of the moon is 14 million square miles. That's a lot. Which is the si 16th of the footage. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. So f 14 million square miles is a bit bigger. It, it's like Russia and Canada put together. That's quite Russia big. Russia and Canada. What laid out flat? Like a map. Well, if you took Russia and Canada off the map and smeared them into a sphere, yeah, okay, that would be the size. Here's an interesting oh. one, though. Yeah. If you were to take all of the water off the Earth 
uh, make it into a sphere and, and put that sphere next to the earth how big would that sphere be it's just a puddle isn't it relative to the all that rocky stuff underneath there's a lot of water though oh i don't know paul what is it tell us well, you, you can make an estimate, can't you? Half a so moon. If the radius of the Earth is 4,000 miles, so the surface area is 4,000 squared. Right. Which is... If you could see Ryan and me looking at each other blankly at this point, you would... Terrified uh, he's six, going to ask six, us a six, question. <laughs> which, is six, which is 16 million. Yeah. Multiplied by four, which is 64 million, multiplied by... Pi, He's which would be a about million. 180 million. Actually, actually, we don't need pi, do we? We can anyway. So never say that. We always need pi. So that's about 180 million. So take 70 percent of 180 million. 18, 20, uh, so that is about 130 million square miles of ocean. Say the average depth of the ocean is a mile. That's 130 million cubic miles. Can you hear so Paul's take brain? Because I think I can <laughs> hear <laughs> Paul's brain. <laughs> I know like you're not going to use this. No, I definitely am going to use this. That's amplified. Ta- take, take, take the cube root of... I can't remember the number I just said. 64 million. What? 64 million. Oh, the cube root of 64 million. Well, that's easy. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's 100 times the cube root of 64. Right, yeah. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, and the cube root of 64 is... Yep, go on, Pete. <laughs> four. <laughs> four. So it's four yeah. is the answer. How big is the moon relative four. to the Earth? Four. <laughs> <laughs> Cracked it. No, we're talking about the, we're talking about the depth. <laughs> so it'll only be a sphere about 300 miles in diameter, which is not very big at all. 300 miles in diameter? I could swim across that. that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad that we both had the same instinct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question. This is a sincere question. Where does water come from? How is it formed? I mean, I know it's H2O, which is hydrogen 2 and oxygen. Like you said, there was a comet that maybe hit the Earth and that's where the water came from. Well, how did the water get on well, the comet? Com- there, there would have been millions of comets. Okay, well, how, how did the water get on the comet? Well, the water would have been made on the comet. The water was made on the comet. Okay. How is it made? <laughs> you could actually use heat or electricity to combine hydrogen and oxygen. Obviously, it would make water. It would make steam or water vapour. But then as, thing, as things get cooled, it would condense out into water. You, you know, everybody's done the experiment of cracking water by running an electric current through it to produce hydrogen and oxygen. It's effectively the same thing in reverse. You know, the, the space shuttle used to burn a hydrogen-based fuel. And when it burned in the air, the byproduct was water. So they they used to launch with very little water on board because when it when it was actually launching, it was just generating loads of water for wow, them. Wow, that's kind of cool. I did not know that. And it just burns hydrogen. That's enough to make water. It just makes water. Water just appears. Well, burning hydrogen in an oxygen atmosphere, yes. In an oxygen atmosphere, okay. If you were to burn hydrogen in a in a, in a carbon atmosphere, you would get methane. Oh, how have I got through life this far? Don't worry, pumpkins have I not next been week. Like, by... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot easier. <laughs> Let's talk about birds. Birds. Birds, baby birds. Okay. I love birds. Paul, your thoughts on birds. Did you have the same thoughts as me? Wings, beaks, claws, bird seed, you know, all the usual bird related well, things? I would have actually thought about, and they, they technically not birds, are they? But you'd think about your pterodactyls. Are they birds? Technically, no. But are they a part of the evolution toward birds? Yes. So are they early birds? Possibly. I feel like you're onto a winner with this episode, mate. I feel like I am. I always think think dinosaurs, it's one of those things in context. So if you see a picture of a T-Rex, it's quite fierce, isn't it? It looks quite Mm. fierce. But if you were to if you if you were to Photoshop a handbag on one of its tiny little arms, (laughs) it turns into about the most camp image you could ever have. I think if I was being chased as as needless to say I would as a caveman being chased by a T 
T-Rex. Can we not even <laughs> contemplate that? <laughs> okay, so men may uh, well, Are you going to have Racco Welsh as well? She's going to pop around. <laughs> I live in hope. In <laughs> but I would carry a handbag with me at all times, just in case, because I thought if I'm being eaten by a T-Rex, I would like the last thing I see to be a <laughs> <laughs> Just hang it on its hand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Aww. So we are talking about dinosaurs and human interaction there, right? Yes, that never happened. Well, you know, crocodiles and alligators exist, and arguably they're still dinosauric. Well, they're not dinosaurs. No, true. But there were creatures called terror birds. Is this the same terror as pterodactyl and terror pteranodon? So it, it starts terror? with a bit P, does no, it? Terror. It starts. Oh, like ah, yeah, it's in scary, scary, oh, right? So, but it should start with a P, shouldn't terror. it? As in pterodactyl, <laughs> yeah, the terror birds, <laughs> the terror birds. <laughs> So given what Pete was talking about last week, I was intrigued. So I went online and was looking up those big giraffe-sized early birds. So I was looking up images of that, and one of the things that came up was a thing called the terror bird. They uh, allegedly grew up to about 10 feet tall, some of them maybe even taller. There's this one skull fossil that has been found somewhat recently, with the skull described as about 71 centimetres, that's 28 inches, with a beak roughly 18 inches or 46 centimetres, with long and curved into a hook shape that resembles like an eagle's beak. And because of that size of that skull, they worked out that it probably stood around about three metres. That's 9.8 feet tall. That's why you've got to get through a doorway quick. Right. But they're saying that with that beak, the distance that it could strike down, it would just rip you apart. Wow. Yeah. So super intimidating. It looks like a giant turkey or like a dodo. <laughs> like a giant... <laughs> killer turkey. Yeah, it looks like a giant dodo. I think it's probably the uh, the best visual description for it. Uh, it was incredible. Yeah, it probably tasted very yeah, nice. Yeah, probably, yeah. It, it was extremely nimble, a uh, quick runner. It was able to reach speeds of up to 30 miles an hour, so we would have had no chance <laughs> uh, running from it. These were around during the Paleogene. Now, obviously, you didn't pick that up because this is South America rather than Jordan, which was the point of your episode. Um, so some of these terror birds existing up to around about 18,000 years ago. That's quite recent. Ooh. Yeah. Almost certainly, early man was having to deal with the terror birds. Oh my lord! On right. the plus side, though, if you cook, if you caught just one, that Sunday's roast was going to be something special. <laughs> yeah, it sure would. Um, They've got to find how many potatoes. Well, they are in South America, so they'd be around. <laughs> yeah, that's right, <laughs> potatoes. Yeah, and it looks like they made their way into Africa as well. There have been some fossils that have been found in Algeria uh, of a of a type of terror bird. It's a it's like a distant cousin called the Lavacatavis. Lavacatavis. Yeah, the. Not quite terror, slightly scary bird. I, I, I knew a few of those. <laughs> yeah, scary bird. We've all met a scary bird in our time. We have. So there you go, terror birds. That was good. I was going to return to your list. You gave me a list of bird-like qualities, and uh, I didn't actually give you the definitive answer as to what constitutes a bird in these modern times. True. So the, the full list is they're, they're warm-blooded vertebrates, so a spine and blood that's warm. Yep. They've got feathers, which you clocked. Yep. Toothless beaked jaws, so beak, which you said. Okay. Hard shelled eggs, so I'll give you that one. They have a high metabolic rate, a four chambered heart, and a strong lightweight skeleton. So nests, no. Birds have W and Z chromosomes, not X and Y. Oh, really? Uh, the, the, the reason they're different is because the, the, the odd thing about birds is if you have a pair of the same chromosome, it's male. And if you have two different ones, it's female, which is exactly the opposite of mammals. So okay. a, a male, a male is X Y, and a, and a female is X X. And now I I don't know which is which, but say a male is W W, so a female will be W Z. And if you're Y Y Y, you're Tom Jones. <laughs> 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 you know, I don't think a Y Y Y could exist. You could have an X Y Y, and even an X Y Y Y, because because wasn't there a television series called the xyy man because basically if you have that xyy which is very rare sort of you're quite thuggish because that that that's the reason why they say you know it's what defines thuggishness is the y chromosome fascinating stuff Do you like birds? Like, do birds scare you? 
No. No? Okay, well, I mean, no. Hitchcock made a movie called The Birds, which was you know, mm-hmm. famous for being quite terrifying about birds attacking people. That was based on a Daphne du Maurier novel. What about you, Pete? Are there any birds that, that freak you out? I find birds quite unsettling. I think it's because they're twitchy nature. Right. Always moving their heads around real quick and uh, basically being evolved dinosaurs, and I don't like it. Uh, if you've ever been chased by a chicken, you'll know it's quite a terrifying thing. <laughs> well, chickens aren't very nice. No, scary things. I've never been scared by birds. I've always been, you know, I, I, I think the first word I said was a colloquialism for a blackbird. The first word you ever said. I'm sure Mama and Papa yes. were highly disappointed when you went, <laughs> Corvid. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not a Corvid, is it? It's passerine. Um, that, that, those were his genuine first words. His friends have gone, look, Paul, there's a Corvid. Well, it's not a Corvid, is it? It's a passerine. <laughs> my first words were dick dick all right we'll cut that there <laughs> not the dick dick <laughs> that's what I the rabbi said <laughs> I, I hope not <laughs> oh, dear. what's your favourite bird I do, I'm a big fan of the corvids. I like a crow or a magpie. I like a smart bird that uh, okay. can recognise well, people. Well, that's interesting because they're the sort of the more creepy ones. Yeah, you like, I like that because I can. I feel like I could come to an accommodation with them. It's the ones that are just all urges that I don't like. Urges? I, I don't understand what you mean. Well, just you can you can make a deal with a crow. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Whereas a chicken is oh, going to okay. go look at you blankly and just come come after you anyway. Yeah, well, I, uh, I like the raptors, I have to say. It's one of those things where you sort of see a raptor in some stupid vole, you know, you sort of... <laughs> You're back in your raptor you, against you, the vole, are you? you? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's, it's like lions and wildebeest, isn't it? Who, who's on the side of the wildebeest? Would you have a kestrel or like a falcon or something? Just a pet one? No, no, it's not right, I think. But I have I have seen a golden eagle in Scotland. They are enormous. Oh, wow, okay. What, a wild uh, one and, or in a... You know, just... In a avery In a bar. <laughs> in a pint. <laughs> you look at that, Paul. <laughs> I think falcon is my favourite. Peregrine falcon, I think. The fastest creature on you earth. You should have been called peregrine. Peregrine Dursley. God, no. <laughs> a peregrine is a name for a bird, not a bloke. I, no one's asked me, so I'll just ask myself. Ryan, what do you like as a bird? <laughs> <laughs> do you think we care? I care, Ryan. No, it's fine. Let's move on. The kiwi produces an egg the same size as an ostrich. Egg. Not no. the same size as an ostrich, but the same size as an ostrich egg. <laughs> yeah. I think, you're, I think what you're trying to say is the kiwi lays an egg that's proportionately very large. No, that's not what I'm saying. I think you are. I've got to look it up now, haven't I? <laughs> uh, but uh, an ostrich, I, I'm looking at an ostrich egg. An ostrich egg is nine inches high. Kiwi egg versus ostrich egg. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to rephrase your question? Kiwi eggs are six times as big as normal for a bird of its size. Ostrich lays the world's largest egg. It's actually the smallest in proportion to the mother, just 2% of her body weight. By comparison, the kiwi egg takes up about 20% of the mother's body. That's a lot of your body to be taken up. Right. Let's round this up and move on to the next bit. Before we begin, Paul, do you have any questions that you would like to ask Mr. Peter Goddard? Your Honour. So, where was Jordan 42 million years ago? That's a great question. Is Jordan where it is at the moment, or is it somewhere Ooh, else? Good question. I love this. Is it, is it at the North Pole, or <laughs> is it... Yeah, because all the tectonic plates are shifting around, right? Yeah, well, I did struggle with this somewhat, because A, the descriptions I had included things like North and South America were moving around, and uh, it wasn't super clear. The Middle East very rarely comes up in these descriptions. Mm. But it mm. seems to me, looking at a map that it seems to be kind of attached to northeast Africa. So rather than there being an Africa gap Middle East, that seems to have all been smushed together and it's kind of there. So okay. geographically, largely the same place. Uh, not massively different. It's not travelled halfway across the globe or anything. Okay. Right, okay. I, I suppose, yeah, that's... You're thinking about it, that's right, because, you know, 42 million years ago isn't that long ago in the history of the Earth, what it's one percent of the history of the Earth. Yeah, yeah you wouldn't expect a, a, a massive shift, but you, you might expect different seas or things like areas underwater or or more land being exposed. Yes, pro- probably you look at the Earth at the time, 
uh, things like Madagascar will probably still be linked to Africa, and right, exactly. Uh, Australia and New Ze- uh, and New Guinea would be linked together, maybe even linked to Asia. But the, I think the general configuration of the continents, maybe with a gap between North and South America, would be similar. Okay, well, uh, hopefully that answered your question, Judge. But now is the time where we must enter the court. Can I request trial by combat? Uh, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Are you clapping? I was just knocking my gavel. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's play the tune. He's the judge, he's the judge. Paul Dursley is the judge. It's time for his judgment, judging all the things we does. Yeah, yeah. All rise for the judge. Okay, here we go. Uh, my lord, Judge Dursley, we stand here before you. One of us, the accused. <laughs> One of us just... <laughs> yeah, are you counsel for the defence or counsel for the prosecution? We've got a unique system here. It's based on the Napoleonic system where one guy just makes it up as he goes along. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's not the Napoleonic system, is it? Because yeah, everything is codified in the Napoleonic... Anyway. <laughs> anyway, Judge, would you mind giving us your grade for accuracy? How accurate was the episode? Did you find it uh, wanting? Well, there wasn't that much about Jordan, really. Oh, that's unfair. So the the I, bone was found in a railway in Jordan. Uh, I'm afraid I can only give you a C minus for that. My goodness, C minus for accuracy. Okay, so knowledge, facts. May I approach you the learn bench? Anything? I'd like to remind your honour no. that you said that you learned many things today. Will the will the accused do, shut up? Do you know? Do you <laughs> know just like what? No this. <laughs> if you'd have kept your mouth shut, you'd have got an A minus. <laughs> But you can get a bloody B plus. Oh, brutalised. I'm writing that down, Your Honour. Objection, Your Honour. No. B plus is written down, Your Honour. Entertainment f- factor. How entertained were you, my lord? Well, well, I will give this a B plus because your song was very, very good and I quite liked your camp dinosaur skit. <laughs> you were imagining a T-Rex with a handbag, weren't you? <laughs> I was envisaging you with a handbag, yes. <laughs> and, it, and it's interesting talking about how things have changed remember when we were kids um you know the t-rex was the big bad dinosaur but of course after jurassic park it's now the velociraptor indeed and of course it's now the terror bird <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, we we now proceed to the final verdict if you would please give us your final grade I am not going to be nasty on this one. Even though I docked you on the one, I'll give you a B plus. Yes! Score! Hooray! I... Justice has been done this day. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I really did. That's amazing. I like the way you sound surprised. I'm amazed. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's end this I bit th- out. No, no, no. I, th- I think that <laughs> there was a lot of science in it, which will, of course, always please me. And that is, after all, why we are here. As opposed to a lot of superstition <laughs> next week. <laughs> oh, my Ryan, you pulled a tough card here, haven't you? I have. Thank you, Your Honour. He's the judge, he's the judge. Paul Dursley is the judge. It's time for his judgment, judging all the things we does. Yeah. Yeah. So, Pete, well done. Congratulations. That is episode 38 in the bag. And we move forward. We look on with greedy eyes to next week's episode, which is episode 39, which is Jack O' Lanterns in South Korea <laughs> <laughs> between 2020 uh, and 2025. I feel like the time period may have saved you there. Well, in the fact that most of it's in the future. Um. <laughs> I could tell you for a fact it hasn't. <laughs> oh dear. You you are you are grading me down before I've even had a chance to utter a word on this episode. It is it is pure superstition, so uh, you'll be lucky to get any more than an E+. Plus. Okay. Well, there you go. You might as well go for it then. <laughs> I'm going to go for full on superstition then. Uh, no, so it is our Halloween special. Uh, it, we're going to have tricks, no. we're going to have treats, we're going to have ghouls, we're going to have jack-o'-lanterns, goblins. Um, we're going to have Korean things, Korean. I guess. You might, Spookies. you might, I'm not. Well, <laughs> we're going to come up and trick or treat your door. 
Live trick or treating. Live, live trick or treating. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah. We can put, dressed as Paul Dursley. We'll both come dressed as judges. I just don't. I, I, we can talk about this next week, but I just do not understand Halloween. I, and that's great. I look forward to the verdict where we can hear you moan for half an hour about <laughs> how much you hate my episode <laughs> <laughs> and, and Halloween. No, I'm looking forward to it. Tune in, listen, bring along a pumpkin. We're going to have a great time. And that is it for this week. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things that we've talked about on this show or just to say hello, you can reach out to us on social media through our website at hhepodcast.com or by email at peteandryan at hhepodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. And you never know, you might end up featured on a future show like Brittany Drury, who got in touch with us to say that she had listened to our episode, It's Not Rocket Science, in Canada during 1800 to 1850. And she had been so inspired by what we'd spoken about, she had reached out to Abby Delaney, the person who we'd had on the call, our lovely Abby, CEO of Key Log Rolling uh, in Minnesota. And she got in contact and said, I'd like to try some log rolling. Yeah, so I'm going to play a little bit of what she said then. Hello, Pete and Ryan. My name is Brittany Drury, and I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. After listening to your episode on It's Not Rocket Science in Canada, I decided to try out log rolling for myself. I was a professional figure skater in the past, so I figured I'd have a pretty good shot at staying on the log, and I thought it would be a fun challenge. Anyway, I just finished my first lesson at Cedar Lake in Minnesota, and it was amazing. My first time getting on the log was less amazing. It was more challenging than I thought it would be, and I think I was only up for maybe two seconds max. It was actually only a 30-minute lesson, which I also thought would be a problem because I figured it would take me a lot longer to learn. But by the end of the 30 minutes, I was totally spent because you have to keep your feet moving all the time to stay on the log. And of course, you're falling off and getting back up, so it's pretty exhausting. By the end of my lesson, I was actually able to keep myself up for a lot longer than I thought I would have. I think I clocked in at about 30 seconds, but it was a ton of work. Uh, So I have no idea how the log drivers were able to do this all day on the river. And not only that, they're in a deep river, so they can't get off and rest like I was able to. So definitely more respect for them and the risky business that they did. Anyway, I just wanted to let you know that I loved my log rolling lesson and I'll definitely do it again. And I wanted to take this moment to publicly challenge Paul Dursley to a log rolling duel. All right. Thanks, guys. Love the show. Bye bye. So there you go. How amazing is that? Paul, are you going to accept the challenge? Absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) Well, she's ahead of you now in terms of practice, to be fair. I think she'd be ahead of me however much practice I had. (laughs) (laughs) No, how great is that? That is amazing. So thank you, Brittany, for getting in touch and reaching out and letting us know. Um, I was was thinking, like, you know, if anybody wants to try out going to Mauritania to do some stand-up comedy or uh, maybe... The paleo gene to fight a terror bird. (laughs) 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 Then report back and let us know. (laughs) So, yeah, look, you don't have to travel all the way to log rolling country to feature on a show. You could just review us and rate us on... Apple Podcasts, especially Apple Podcasts, because those recommendations really help distribute the word of the show to the world at large. Uh, also, if you're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, you can find us at HHE Podcast. Uh, subscribe to them and you'll get an alert when we post a little one minute animated HHE bite. That's right. And we'll be back again soon with our next episode. But in the meantime, if you can't get enough of the show, check out our back catalogue of episodes. Uh, you can find that in your podcast app on YouTube or on our website, HHEPodcast.com. All right. So, a huge thank you to the judge himself. Thank you, Paul. Where's he gone? <laughs> he disappeared. Paul. Can you hear me? Where have you gone? <laughs> you missed your cue. Um, well, I moved and I hadn't moved the microphone, so that's totally my fault. All right. So, a huge thank you to the judge himself. Thank you, Paul. My pleasure. And that's it. I guess all that's left to say is... You've been listening to... History happened everywhere. The verdict. 
Say I had a dripping tap in my bath and the plug was in. How long would it take to fill the bath? Two years. Okay. <laughs> One drip. Yeah. A second, say. Is uh, is what half uh, a teaspoon. Yeah. Which is about five milliliters. Yeah. So five milliliters. Fill a, an entire bath. How many milliliters in a in a bath? Thousands. Thousands. Of <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, what's the size of so a bath? Work it out. Thousands of milliliters by. Five How long is a bath? About an hour. How long is a bath? <laughs> <laughs> How long is a bath? How wide is a bath? How deep is yeah, a bath? I think two years. I think he's right. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know you are actually you are actually on the right line? <laughs> So if, if, if we speak metric, so you could say a bath is approximately two metres long by half a metre high by half a metre wide. So that's... This comes in at two, two years. Times, <laughs> two times. So, so it, it's, it's a half a cubic metre and a cubic metre is a thousand litres if it was the, if, if, if the bath was that size. Okay. So you're talking about 500 litres, which is half a tonne of water. And so, how many of your five centiliter, sorry, five milliliter drops in a 500 liter bath? Two years? <laughs> Four. God! <laughs> but it's easy! <laughs> it's easy for you, Paul. <laughs> We're thick as two short planks. I, I'm terribly sorry. Yeah, I don't use any of that. I was... <laughs> no, Pete, I'm... no, that was hysterical. Let... So what is it? What is the answer? I need to know the answer, though. Well, ha- how many five milliliters are there in 500 liters? 100,000. So 10,000. One liter. 100. No, 10,000. So what? 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> so one liter is 1,000 milliliters. Yeah. So 500 is 500,000 milliliters. That's like, uh, that's nearly half a million. Of which there is five. And your answer of 100,000 was correct. Yay. I did answer several other answers that weren't correct. <laughs> Pig kidney transplanted into brain dead person. <laughs> Sorry.